Hey, hello, welcome to the Cube Pod. We are in Atlanta for supercomputing, recording our Cube Pod this week because we'll be traveling, of course, the Cube is here at supercomputing. This is Cube Pod episode 83. Dave is in person. Hey, John, good <laughs> That's to see you. the same you. face you get on the Cube <laughs> on, the, on the remote. All right. I'm Great. happy to be here, come on. Gotta love that smile, Dave, a lovely <laughs> smile. Salute to you, Dave. That was great. Um, look, at, I love the fact that we can get this done because we're going to be hot and heavy F1s this week. I'm trying to get there. Um, looks it's in like, Austin? No, it's in Vegas. Oh, in Vegas. Yeah, so, yeah. And also we got to prepare for reInvent. I got so many scoops on reInvent. It's going to be great. Um, but the Q-Pod here is special because we're live, one. And two, uh, supercomputing has been, again, exceeded my expectations. I already had a high bar. Um, and from last year, I knew it was going to be great and, uh, and, and robust in terms of content and activity and enthusiasm, but I'm more confident this year because what's happened this year is that the meat is on the bone. The sizzle and the steak are here. You start to see real progress. Um, notables are Dell. Obviously, Dell's had a huge show. Um, even uh, the displays, Hewlett Packard Enterprise had a great display. Um, tons of meeting rooms, super busy. This AI factory positioning that Dell has is pretty going to work for all the big um, server manufacturers, which include Lenovo, HPE, and everybody else that all win. But I think Dell clearly is out front on this one because their relationship with NVIDIA from GTC carried over with the AI factory. The work that the team did is clearly being uh, shown here. That's proof. Uh, proof is in the pudding, as they say. So shout out to Dell. But it's not just Dell, it's a rising tide. It's floating all the boats. And, and you well, said on theCUBE here that this is like GTC for the industry, which the industry needs. Yeah. I mean, the industry needs a show now. So, so this is a trade show. It's not just a conference. Um, and there's a lot of side activities going on and everywhere. So like, I walked, I had to get a hotel a couple blocks away, 15 minute walk, so I don't mind getting my steps in, but I had a chance to navigate through the ho different hotels packed with uh, meetings. Right, so, so floors packed, so meetings are packed. Dell's at the Marriott, they took over the Marriott. Right? I'm, in, I'm in the Omni, HPE is all over the Omni. I mean, everywhere you go, there's HPE stuff, Vast is there as well. This is a hardcore hardware show. Lenovo's all over it as well. But yet, I'm, I'm looking at Rubric. I'm like, holy cow, there's a software companies. And, yeah. and so, surprising to see, you got hose companies, you got liquid cooling companies, you have you have uh, universities, Texas A&M, UT Austin, University of Maryland, University of Indiana, all their supercomputer centers, and of course you've got the mainstays of all the big labs, you know, the ones that for years have been doing supercomputing. Yeah, and, um, and just a, a, so much content, I'm, I'm getting, uh, I'm not urgent calls, no one calls anymore, but texts from our editorial team and our digital team. There's more volume of stories coming in. It's been a heavy week of activity, We've got the Thanksgiving holiday break coming up. We've got Christmas holidays and, and the holiday season there. And you got reInvent coming up. We have um, NYSE, our, we, we have a new set on the floor of the Stock Exchange. If you're, not, if you're not a CUBE follower, you know that we have that. If you follow the CUBE, you know we're at the NYSE with a studio there now. We're going to be there on the uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th for a media week, cybersecurity and AI leaders. Again, AI security leaders. We're also going to have a first ever CFO AI Summit in the Palo Alto studios. That's going to be a new event for us as we've been interviewing CFOs kind of randomly coming on theCUBE and the, tr the pattern is that CFOs are, are tasked with na nail nailing down the business model transformation with AI. So the AI transformation is a business transformation. It's not a technical transformation only. So business model transformation. And how do you forecast for, for the CapEx that the J.P. Morgan Chase is going to have to deal with. How do you figure out the financing or the hedging? What's the financing vehicles? How do you budget for it? You heard Dell, more efficient than ever, but they laid off a lot of people, right? So we're in a, we're in a really transformative time where CFOs are, are at the table. So the CFOs are, are critical. We have that event, and then on the 18th, uh, we're going to have another day for AI leaders in Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley version, not New York, but the Valley, and then the 18th, we're having a holiday uh, reception um, and there, so we got a dinner on the 16th, and then reinvent, and then the year starts again. It's 2025, <laughs> next thing you know, the blink of an eye is 2025. Meanwhile, we're in a tornado of news, 
uh, content. Earnings. Earnings, and Snowflake up 18% merging, bringing Anthropic yes. and Claude to Cortex. So I'm looking at Snowflake now, they, they grew 28%, they beat by 33% by on EPS, they were 20, 20 cents versus 15. They're guiding to $3.4 billion in product revenue for next year. I think, honestly, I think what happened there is they tamped down expectations so much last quarter. I mean, 28% growth for Snowflake is solid, but it's not like eye-popping, but they tamped down their expectations last quarter and they beat. And I think, you know, look, they were trying to give Sridhar Ramaswamy, the new CEO, a little bit of breathing room. I mean, crying out loud, the guy's following the Bill Belichick of, of coaches, of, of, of CEOs and Frank Slootman. So, I'm glad to see that they, you know. Well, the big, new, the big news on Snowflake on that, on that earnings Anthropic, call, Anthropic, yeah. and obviously AWS's relationship. We're going to have a very, we're going to have an exclusive with Matt Garman that I recorded last Friday. You're going to see Anthropic take a centerpiece role in uh, AWS's bedrock. Um, and then, again, NVIDIA, I think it's just, I think that's just market fluctuations, but they're not stopping. And Snowflake uh, and AWS are very close. I mean, they're, they're, they've always been str strong, well, not always, but they're strong partners. And the other one is NVIDIA, NVIDIA announced, and they had, you know, they grew 94%. They basically beat, they raised, but it wasn't, you know, it was like last quarter. They beat and raised, but it wasn't by, you know, again, eye-popping numbers. Yeah. But these are eye-popping numbers. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, this it's, is insane. It's, 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 it's mind-blowing performance by NVIDIA. I just got to say, anyone who thinks NVIDIA was not, is facing headwinds is just a tool in my mind. So like, NVIDIA continues to thrust. Now, I, I've said on theCUBE, you, you heard me say this, I'll st I'm still sticking with my story, Dave. NVIDIA's success does not mean it game's, game is over. A AMD is coming at them. All right, you got Cerebrus competing directly at the, would, the big would, green they're machine. Gonna get their, they're going to get their now, crumbs off the table. They're coming at them. Crumbs? They, yeah, they're not going to dis. They're not going to belong. Wipe, they're not going to disrupt Nvidia's moat, in my opinion. Well, I mean, it's not about disrupting. It's just a huge market. Well, as, as you say, it's not about. It's not, <laughs> the top three win big. Like, just well, not, this is what. Can I just say something before you go on? Normally in markets, number one makes a ton of money. Number two makes a little bit of num the money. Number three barely breaks even. The cloud changed that. You got three big cloud, even Google's now printing money in the cloud. So to your point, I think absolutely the market's big enough to support three big GPUs. All right, you're, clients. A, you're a horse guy since I, horse you're, you're, yeah. I met your friend who's here, who's, uh, you guys do the horse Saratoga betting in Saratoga. Joe, yeah. All right, so horse racing. Secretariat was a dominant horse, would you agree? Yeah, maybe Deep, perhaps lap, the greatest of all time. Greatest of all time. Perhaps. No one could catch that horse. Is NVIDIA a secretariat horse? Yeah. Or is it going to be AMD and neck and neck, but then NVIDIA just runs I away think, with it? I think, I think NVIDIA is secretariat. Now, remember, secretariat has lost <laughs> races before, right? He lost the race before the Kentucky Derby. He lost in Saratoga. So every now and then, the competition comes in and gets wins. Yeah. So it does happen. Yeah. So the, no, and a, I think so AMD's going to get it, its So wins. is this a stakes race then? This is, this is the highest stakes race. <laughs> this is like when they put up $20 million in the Dubai Classic. That's what this is, you know, when the Sheik's put up all trillion. the Trillion, they've got a T on yeah, there. Listen, put a 20, T on there. $20 trillion. Put some T's on there. Okay, so NVIDIA obviously we're, we're bullish on, but I think that game is not over. Again, I think this is not a runaway freight train. I think NVIDIA will be the leader for a long, long time but AMD has things going on. Wait, wait, what's a long, long time? Let's unpack that a little oh, bit. Oh, at least, uh, uh, so take the cycle. So, so if we're in gen one cycle of this clustered era, clustered systems era. 150 million through a hundred, a trillion dollar ten, transition. Ten, ten year. Did you hear that stat? That's what Jensen no. said the other day. We're a hundred, or somebody, I think it was Jensen. 150 billion through a trillion dollar transition. Yeah. So you're saying we're 15% of the way. Uh, I mean, okay. I mean, just to put some context around Maybe it. I think less than that, but okay, that's okay. a small number, but it's relatively, it's not 50, right. not 40. But if you look at a 10 year horizon, in, in all these super cycles, I love the word super, super cycle, super chip, super cloud, um, and these, all these super cycles, and the one that's closest to this is I think the 90s, which that comment came up a lot on theCUBE all the time in the past couple months. The 90s was the infrastructure revolution where open source, open systems managed it. Internet was building on that, but still a major in, in, inflection point. So, those two kind of the same. But let's take the 90s inflection point. Cisco um, was founded in, I think, 94, one of those days, I can't remember, it was one of those days. But it got up two years into their foundation, they had, you know, um, they replaced the management team, brought in the, the execs. 
two years into it, they went from the third year to the fifth year. Third to fifth, sixth, seventh year, they won the game. So I think we're in a similar case. I think it's a 10 year gen. 1984, by the way, Cisco. 84? They were founded. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So 84, so fast forward 86. So, yeah, it took them 10 between years. Between 86 and 92, they won. Take that range. There was no other competitor. They had Wellfleet routers, there's other routers, other players in there. Switches got that decimated because the But switch. they weren't dominant until the second, the second 10 years. No, that first sprint, of the, the, after their third year of inception, say, say 86, okay. pick 86 as a date. When the transition from open systems happened was between 86 and 90, well, give or take. Because you still had SNA, you had all these other architectures, Token Ring, Ethernet was coming on the scene. So let's pick a date, 88 to 94. Those small years, Cisco dominated because they connected all the companies with TCP IP. So they ran the table and became number one and never looked back. I think NVIDIA has that same scenario and, and, and that's one scenario where they win. So in these super cycles, the first four years is everything, in my opinion. You got to dominate the new architecture and that's going to be the key to success. NVIDIA has a small window, I mean AMD has a small window to stand up a, either a core weave like partnership and then get the GPU game matching as close as possible to NVIDIA. They just got to get close. I would say this, so you, you think 10 years? Well, I think 10 years is the, is the final scoreboard of this first wave. So you're saying- But it, the it, next five years is going to be absolutely but, so, the, 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 the uh, game will be decided in the next five years. So I, so I think NVIDIA's moat is 10 years at least, okay? Here's what I think, number one. Number two is I think AMD's going to get its fair share, but I don't think AMD's fair share is going to be as big as it is with x86, because unless NVIDIA fumbles, so Intel took its eye off the ball, it's insisting on Foundry, it opened the door for AMD, AMD's gaining share in x86. I don't think the same thing's going to happen in AI with NVIDIA, we'll, we'll see. Well, and then, then the other wild card is you got guys like Cerebrus, but I think they're going to get the top of the pyramid, right? They're not going I mean, after the fat middle. Well, my, first of all, you're, we're a little bit not aligned on that. So I, I was not saying the moat for 10 years. I agree with you, I think they have a 10 year moat. Okay. The game over stat, <laughs> when it's game over as leader. So I don't think the leadership will be, I think the leadership of number one in category is going to still be determined. NVIDIA is clearly out front. Oh, interesting. That's a big call. Okay. That's a bold well, call, I mean, John. Well, every so do they have a monopoly right now? Um, yes. Okay, they I do. would agree. I, they do. And I'm saying their monopoly, let's, let's frame it a bit. I'm saying their monopoly will last at least 10 years. You're saying maybe not. No, well I think, well, I think the next five years, NVIDIA has to mean, I'd say, because it's fast, to say three years. Three to five years, NVIDIA is number one. If it maintains that lead in a la secretariat, se separating from the field, they win. The game will be over in three years if NVIDIA keeps separating from the field. It's like Broadcom when they were on. So they, every time they have a new chip, the competitor meets it and they exceed it. So I, NVIDIA's got to surpass. They can't let anybody catch up. If I uh, had to take your side of the argument, I would say that, that, that government intervention could be what potentially slows them down a little bit because Microsoft, they never really had government intervention, intervention until it was too late, right? The cloud guys. The cloud guys are finally now getting government intervention, like <laughs> Apple, right? It was too late, they've already got the monopoly. So the question is, can NVIDIA, we both agree they have a monopoly, can they use their monopoly power to build that bigger moat? I mean, and, and monopoly I think that, is a big word, I don't like, I don't like that they, word. They have, define it, the monopoly, they I get 100% of the market, that's like basically a 99%, <laughs> okay. I mean, it's a monopoly. <laughs> I, the 75% gross I just margin. don't like the word. I know, but it's I, true, I, I a monopoly is, you know have it They have mind it. share. You know it when you see <laughs> they it. They have I mean, market 75% share. 75% gross margin for, for, for any company, you know, that's not a software company, it's just remarkable, even though they have a lot of software. So, what I, all I'm saying is that public policy could affect, could knock, knock them down a little bit unless the current administration lets them go. In other news, uh, the Biden administration has finalized the 1.5 billion CHIPS Act incentives for global foundries, meaning can start receiving federal funding. So I'm cool with that. For Vermont and New York. I'm good with that. But, but the, the piece I'm not cool with is they're now rushing to spend the other 30 billion that's tied up, and they're yeah. rushing to do that before the new administration comes in. And I'm like, oh, wait, why don't we press pause here yeah. and think about what's the right strategy for the CHIPS Act money, which I've always had concerns about the CHIPS Act. 
and industrial policy. And I we think, can talk about that. I think, I think Trump could hang his hat on this as one of his legacy items. We can make U.S. competitive in chips, we'll see. I think you're right, it's a long, it's a long, it's a long game, big bridge to build. Um, other news from the Wall Street Journal, your favorite publication, um, <laughs> it's, uh, XAI. Next to Silicon Angle. I love how you brought the Wall Street Journal into the queue, it's great. And they got the article wrong too, I got to call that out. Like <laughs> Ethernet, not as a, a mature technology. Old, that, that young, that brand new technology. I mean, how, how, how bad is the Wall Street Journal in that article? <laughs> e InfiniBand, a more superior approach compared Ethernet, and not as adopted, like what? They got it wrong, okay, whatever. I, I love the Wall Street Journal. Um, XAI told investors to raise five billion in funding round, valuing it at 50 billion and its revenue has reached, reached 100 million on annualized basis. Who's this? I mean, XAI. So we had DDN and said they're a customer, so they're a large scale, that's Twitter, that's Elon Musk, okay? His artificial, artificial intelligence startup is 100 million in revenue. You know what's interesting about that, John? Remember we talk about Jassy all the time, there's no compression algorithm for experience. Elon's like challenging that algorithm. He's like compressing the time to a, the AI factory to, what was it, a couple hundred days? Yep. They, they say 122 days or whatever. They're not quite there yet, it's from my, my sources, or saying, yeah. look, they stood it up, yeah. but it's still working out some kinks, but still, you know, yeah. that's... I, I, yeah, one of the things that's coming out of my interviews leading up to reInvent, we heard it here on Supercomputing, is that companies that have scale are seeing problems that no one else can see before they happen and fix them. Uh -huh. AWS has it, NVIDIA has it, which is why Jensen's quoted as saying, that's why we're building our own machine, because we have scale that no one else has. Google and Microsoft And then it. X has it, Azure has, so scale is the new competitive advantage, it's the barriers to entry, because if you have scale, if you have an operation that has scale and the new entrants come in and can't match the scale, um, they are, they're going to be constantly catching up, so just keep the scale going, whether it's you know, an app or uh, the cube, or just like we continue to do the same thing. In the real world, X is in there. I mean, meta. So I just think the whole software game is going to change. This has come out on this show, is, is that um, we don't yet know what software is going to be written for these AI factories. We don't know what the JP Morgan chases of the world will do. And so, you're seeing all kinds of um, bubblicious behavior. Um, in news, I just saw this on, on, on TechCrunch, French AI startup called H. Yeah, they got I letters, we should call ourselves the C, for the cube. The C. And fashionable to raise some <laughs> money. Raised 220 million in seed funding. That's a pretty seed damn, round. That's a big that's seed a pretty round. damn good seed <laughs> round, Dave. <laughs> this, we're going to start a new company called the C. <laughs> start, call our AI, let's raise a $100 million seed round. Private beta. Seed round. Yeah, I, I haven't seen the okay, product. If that's not bubblicious, if oh, yeah, I mean, we are we're in bubblicious right now, nobody's denying that. What do you make? Of uh, that just blows my mind. That's that's that that means are the markets rational, right? I mean, this is you know, they had a new administration uh, coming in. Well, no one knows where the ball is going to fall. You know, the, the markets are saying this is going to be big. That's what they're saying now. The timing of that is always funny. But what do you think of? the government and the current administration, which appears to be trying to rush uh, some kind of decision about Google antitrust and Chrome. Now, it was started, I guess, with the Trump administration, but so maybe it'll continue, but the first Trump administration, but splitting out Chrome? I don't, I don't I mean. I don't see that. It's like, come on. I don't see that. Well, that's, that's what they're talking about. That's, that's just, yeah. This is you, the oh, news. You, you, know, you know, I'm a hawk when it comes to defense. I'm also uh, a hawk on capitalism. I think there's a point where, to your your point, which is if they're really doing bad things, you got to look at that, not just because yeah, they're Yeah, regulate big. them in a way, that, but, but don't break them up. I mean, Chrome, if you don't like Chrome, get another browser. Well, but, okay, they, but, the, but, the, but okay hey, look, say that you can't pay Apple $20 billion a year, I'm fine with that. And, yeah. then, it, and then you're just going to go and select Chrome as your primary browser. Well, look at, look at, Matt, Mark Zuckerberg came out and said, basically what he learned in his growth, younger years, now he's 40, He's like, look it, I realized that I was at the, at the whim of Apple. That's never going to happen again. And so, look at, if you look at what WhatsApp's doing and with, with WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook, they're building one thing. So, you know, we, are, we all go on planes where you get free texting. Well, if you're on Android, I can't iMessage you, but I can WhatsApp you, right? So WhatsApp is messaging. So you start to see Meta do that. You're going to start to see them have their own interfaces. 
they don't want to be ever constrained to Apple, so he's, they're building their own. So that's competitive. What so if Apple got into the advertising business? Well, that <laughs> took, took Google on. Amazon is in one of their fastest growing oh, areas. Amazon's got great advertising. I interviewed, Are you me? I interviewed Colleen Aubrey, who ran that business. She now runs AWS Solutions. You can see an article on Silicon Angle, exclusive story of the new AWS leader building AWS Solutions. You should, ask, you should ask Jassy next time you have him on. You're going to see him, I know. Dude, Amazon's ad but, business but, is but, booming. But when, you, when you buy stuff from Amazon now, it's like going through 10 blue links. You, you got, I mean, they make it obvious what's sponsored, but there's a lot of sponsored it, stuff the, on the, there now. The, 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 the game in advertising is always been, they can always opt out. Yeah, five different gray font, corner, right. uh, technically it's there. Right. They have a choice. And you're multitasking, <laughs> and you're picking the sponsored <laughs> and one. And you right. accidentally click subscribe, but next thing you know you got Paramount. But that's a big, you know, like, big part of their business. No. I mean, it's a growing part of their business now. Yeah, I mean. Never underestimate how dumb users are sometimes. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to get ease of, ease of know, use. Click. Guilty as charged sometimes. Yeah. I'm just clicking away. I don't click on the like, like I go, Where did I get that charge from? Oh shit, I clicked buy on yeah, the yeah, movie. Right. I thought it was free. <laughs> that, just, I just, that. <laughs> click, 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 click. <laughs> um, busy week, Dave, again. Palo Alto Network, disappointed. You see that? I, I did, was down. I did, I did. I think, I think Palo Alto Networks is uh, playing the platform long game. Um, we'll see how they do. CrowdStrike uh, announced this week too, but I mean basically, I think this is the bottom of for CrowdStrike because they reset the, the guidance and the stock came back very nicely, but I think this is the bottom of the net new uh, ARR. I think it'll start climbing up from here. We'll see, we'll see what happens with the Delta. So here's another story, Trump's Trump team, is, Trump's team is, is talking with the crypto industry over whether to create a White House post dedicated to cryptocurrency policy and is vetting candidates currently. So we all know Trump wants to do a Bitcoin reserve. He wants to put crypto on the balance sheet. That's, you know, how, that's I mean, his, his gimmick for solving the debt problem. <laughs> Bitcoin's at 94,000, Dave. I know. A lot of people are happy. If, so, you, if you look at the six month trend, it's up from 60,000 and it was as low as 53. In August of 2024, 54, the low watermark was um, September 8th, 50, 53,000. Did you see the gentleman we had on earlier today? Um, John Stevens from Hot Isle, do you know him? After the election, it went from 68,000 and it, it's now at 94,000. Yeah, it's up. It's going to be 100,000. It's, it's, hold, it's been holding over above 90, it's been trying. You know, the sellers have been trying to knock it down past 90,000, but it's, it's held there. So, um, so, so today, um, we had on John Stevens, and he was, he was an early crypto guy. He got into crypto in 2013. He was funded by the guys who funded, the guy who funded uh, Anthony DiOrio and Vitalik yeah. for Ethereum. So yeah. he was early on, on, on Ethereum. And um, he was early on in Java, He's like one of the creators of Java. Yeah, I, chatted, I chatted with him after. He's a cool guy. I was asking him, what's your take on Ethereum? And he said when it went from proof of work to proof of, of stake, <clears throat> you know, it affected the price, but he feels like it's undervalued right now. I, I don't know, I mean, I own, I, own, I own many of them, but he's like, you know, really sanguine about crypto. And spe specifically Ethereum, the, the angle on Ethereum that I've always liked, John, is when, when we saw Solidity as the programming language to enable useful you know, applications to be built on top of the platform versus Bitcoin, which is you know, it's a store of value, it's the digital gold, that always interested me. And Ethereum, for the most part, had, had tracked Bitcoin, obviously a lower price, but it really hasn't in this last cycle. When, when Bitcoin ran up to whatever, 68, you know, 73,000, Ethereum didn't go back to its earlier highs of whatever it was, 4,500, and it still hasn't tracked it, so it may be undervalued. I don't know, that's not investment yeah. advice, but yeah. something to look at. Yeah, I think, that's a, I think that's a good read. I think it just jumped on the wave. Um, Databricks reportedly now looking to raise eight billion to cash out employees. Um, <laughs> what do you think that says about an IPO the, the, timing, the, the, John? The quote, the quote from, Alex Wilhelm, one of the uh, a journalists, this drip drip is getting kind of ridiculous. Just 
fucking go public. Well, <laughs> <quote. laughs> good. That, thank you for that quote. Alex what you, Wilhelm. What, what do you think? What do you think that means for going public? That says 2025 might might be yeah. a pretty tepid well, year for IPOs. The information had um, some in, some commentary on this. They were saying that Databricks was cashing out some employees who had st stopped tax problems. And so this might have been a cleaning house before going public. They have to go public. They Eight can't. billion though? And, and so <laughs> <laughs> At a $55 billion valuation, right? Wasn't it 55 billion? Keep What's Snowflake's valuation? Hey, what is Snowflake's valuation? Can't be much more than that. I don't know, but I mean, Databricks' data warehouse is it's, doing extremely it's, it's well. It's 42 billion. Yeah, I mean, okay. that's that's pre-market. Oh, that's after the close. It's up. Well, it's up. It's up 20 percent from there. I, I so add another eight billion onto that. The so NYSE is already has a private so, index going on, as pre-public companies are trading. So what's happening is they're creating an index for pre-public. So it's going to be a pre-public market, which means it's quasi-public. Is it liquid? Yes. Retail so they're going to take on like like Link, Link Two, like you know the, the Link Two platform. The retail investors are going to get access to these sell sales. So it's just, it's not an active, real market. The retail investor is going to get screwed like they always do because what's going to happen there is it, is all the insiders are going to get the best price, and then and then they're going to sell it to the dumb money, the the dumb retail guys like all of us, right? And they're going to pay a premium, and then the IPO is going to go out probably at a lower price. But so. Be careful with that, that's all I'm saying. That sounds like you got an opinion on that, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's these platforms, right? They're buying up, the, they're buying up these, 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 these you know, stocks in bunches at a discount, and then they're selling it to the suckers. But hey, look. It, not if it goes up. It, it, you're right, if it goes up, it's good. If but it it's goes like, up, then the retail investors but the can fluff, get it. The fluff in those prices is, yeah. is pretty substantial. As Andy Kessler always says, it's not a real market. There's no ongoing flow. And it's really not that liquid. It's not liquid, there's not right. a lot of float going around. Right. So it's pretty much a private round. So, but it's public. Like, <laughs> like what? <laughs> I, right. Come on, it's public. Well, they probably see- That's what, why Alex Wilhelm's comment, just go, go public, is real. It's like, come on, just to get over with, go well, public. And you but, heard DDN's founder, going public's a pain in the, pain in the ass for them. Well, look, think about what they've done. Because earlier on, um, I, I Alex think, and, 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 and Paul Block, they kind of threatened to go public for a while and sort of dangled that out to employees and so forth. They, they kept it private, but what a good move keeping it private. Can you imagine if they were a public company now? I mean, it, it's just, and they had to go through probably 10 years of this quarterly shot clock, 90 yeah. day shot clock. Now they well, own Michael them. Dell went private then public. I mean, the markets have different options for certain people. Like I said, yeah, the, but the counter argument for DDN is you can change, you're, he's already rich. So why not just go public and let people tap into, let retail people ride the wave? I, so, I, so there's an argument to go public, and I think I think there will be a good IPO market. I think, well, I think next I year there'll Maybe. be 80 to 100 tech IPOs. That's my prediction. 80 to 100 tech IPOs. And what you, was what was pre? I mean, 2021 was out of control, right? It was hundreds and hundreds, right? Tech IPOs? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know the I don't know the number. Well, you know, now that we're in New York, we got to get these facts right. I, I think I know. Right, we're just spitballing here. AWS is a new that. CMO, by the way, Julia White. I saw that. Regine stepped down. I saw that. That's um. I don't. Know, what do you make of that? I make I I I make it that Amazon is changing. Matt Garman liked Regine. Um, might have been a personal thing. I mean, Regine's solid. She's a great executive. So. What do you yeah. about the What do you know about the new? CMO. Uh, we're first degree uh, contacts, but she was at SAP. Before that, big stint at Microsoft. Right, I saw that. Um, very seasoned executive. Um, I think the Microsoft background in SAP, um, she knows how to play the big corporate machinery, and Amazon's a unique company. They're not, it's hard to be a CMO at Amazon because they have different groups. I love it, the kids behind you on TV. Hey kids! <laughs> we got fans. Get them in early. Start them early on the cube. <laughs> Get right. them while they're young. Right. Like, uh, like Steve Jobs hey, hanging out Max. Hey, what do you think about Kubernetes? Oh, it's not it's ready for prime time. It's too boring. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that? We had a guest on today and uh, he has like a 13-year-old son. He sent them. Did you see the, uh, yeah. the quantum? He said it was boring. He said it was boring. <laughs> So there's a, a cool story demo. on Silicon Angle I want to share with you. Apparently, Ra, um, Mark Alverson wrote a story about a company called Cloud Brink, okay? Um, 
met with the founders, did a story, and it turns out there was a big snafu between the founders. And one of the founders apparently was sandbagging the board or whatever, so something's going on, something weird. As startups always have some weird shit going on. So, the company fires the guy, he sues them, sues the fired CEO, sues the company, and, and then apparently hired an, uh, a firm, reputation management firm, to t start taking down blog posts. So they create a fake Tumblr account <laughs> to oh, claim that our article was fraudulent, <clears throat> so Google de deleted our article. What? So they censored our article, so this firm was strategically trying to manipulate the press results. Kind of scrub their... Uh... Scrub the press. And so, of course, our that journalist, Mark Abbott, was all over it, so he did an investigative <laughs> piece and found, found the evidence that they hired a firm whose whole job was to manage the Google search result to delete negative results. And they have a tactic where they create a Tumblr blog and they write a bunch of stuff on it and claim that ours was theirs or some weird like, and then Google just says, oh, that's right. So it's a head fake. They take Google's um, policies and they make it so it's compliant with the takedown and gets taken down, but they left the, the SF gate, which is the San Francisco Chronicle page, and that was on there. And so when we found it, we're like, we got to get the article back. We don't want to get killed because that could penalize our Google juice, as they say. So, of course, yeah. So he investigates, Google reinstates the article, and he wrote an expose. Reinstated our article. Our article. Oh, nice and, job, Mark Albertson, and, well done. And, <laughs> and writes a killer expose. What's this title of this called? Cloud Brink. Wow. Check I mean, it out. I could have got a better title to get people to click on it, but Cloud Brink, Silicon Angle. Um, <clears throat> okay. Dead air, John, can't have that. How about this NVIDIA story that came out uh, last week or this week? The information reported that customers have raised serious concerns about the issue of the upcoming Blackwell graphics processing units, which have already been delayed to market and now are reportedly encountering overheating issues that prevent their deployment in data center racks. And so, Cloud they, Brink. In, Cloud Brink. In, Brink. NVIDIA has asked um, customers to redesign their data center rack. They've already told suppliers to alter the design of their racks several times to try and resolve the overheating problem, but without success. So that's interesting. It's, it's interesting in the context, John, of all week we've been talking about liquid cooling, and we've been talking about two-phase versus single-phase. We heard from um, experts at Dell that, hey, right now, single-phase is working, it's simpler, they can use warm water. We heard from Dr. Luca Amalfi saying, no, ultimately, two-phase is going to be cheaper and more effective. So there's kind of this interesting debate in the context of this overheating yeah. problem. I mean, um, the power and cooling thing is huge because there's different approaches. Air-cooled, there's liquid-cooled, um, and then there's- um, Immersion. On chip. So I interviewed JetCool and the, on the New York Stock Exchange uh, in our new studio <laughs> there, and they're from MIT. They have a process that this little kind of layer sits on top of the chip and senses when it's heating and splashes like coolness on it. What, like in Vegas when they splash yes. the mist yeah, on you? Yes, I mean it's not mist per se, but it's similar <laughs> and it cools it down and it knows where it's hot at any given time on the chip. And so that's state of the art stuff. So you're going to start to see innovation come in this area. Wait, like dew drops? I mean, you no, go It just want. makes it co cooler. But blowing air? No, it makes the, their little piece cooler with like. You can't be dropping liquid no, it's into not, the. It's not liquid, it's just cool. I mean, I must, <laughs> they must have some process. Again, MIT, who knows what they're doing yeah, over there. Could be. So, but that's on the chip, and it senses when, when it's going to get hot, hotter, Interesting. and it just gets out in front of it. And so that's one approach on, directly on chip. So you're going to see different approaches, and they each cost money, and they're all fragmented, right? So you have different solutions, every vendor has their own different thing. So that's not certainly a standard area. They, Dell talks about open standards. Everyone talks about open standards, but there's no standard in it's, cooling. You're right, it's the wild west. It's stovepiped big time, as you say. So, so that's an area. But in general, the three things that um, are What was the name of the company? You uh, Jet Cool. Jet Cool. I had Cool IT on this week, and they do a little cold plate on top of the chip. Yeah. And they run liquid through it. That's what this, these guys do. So it's a DT, very... DTC, direct to chip. Yes, that's what they're right. doing. And then, but, but by the way, all those systems, I think most of them anyway, are hybrids, where they have air-cooled. to, Because uh, I think Ehab said it, or maybe it was another guest, 85% of the heat is resolved by the liquid cooling, but the other 15% can be resolved with air. So that it's, you know, it's cheaper and, you know, less. Jet cool is cool. 
That's risky. Cool chip, IT direct cool. chip to cooling. The, 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 the engineering coming out of this show, I'd just say falls in the three categories of supercomputing. Power, to power the system, so you're seeing innovation there. Space constraint, there's not a lot of limited space. Right. Space is tight. Um, so people are optimizing for racks, you start to see the clusters come in. And then, um, and then obviously, price performance. Yeah, and power and cooling are the same. Power side and cooling. Two, two, two different sides of the same coin. Well, no, both kind of serious problems. No, but I'm saying, they're very much related. But, but in terms of engineering focus, that's where all the companies seem to be spending their energy on those three areas. Power and cooling is one category, but they've been broken well, out. Well, you don't have enough power, so, because you're cooling the systems. Yeah. So if you can, if you can raise the temperature of the data center, no, but you, you even, use even, less power. Even if you have power, you still have heat problems. But the power is related to expansion. I can't get my GPUs to work if I'm adding more GPUs. It has nothing to do with yeah. cooling. So the, the, they're kind of related from a category standpoint, but they're, they're related depending on where you are, right? If I want to throw in... Well, I'm just saying, if you can get your PUE, the closer you can get it to, to 1.0, right, you're going to yeah. ha have more headroom in your power. And that's why these racks are important. That's why the Dell's engineering their own racks because they can control that, right? They can control that piece. So, you know, to me, it's just those are the airs. Now, that's the infrastructure. So as this game gets faster, we are going to rock and roll and see the data layer kick in. And again, that's the supercomputing vibe here. And so, I, I got it. It reminded me of something. Um, Ignite is this week, okay? And we haven't had time to follow. I did, I did uh, Ignite remotely last year. I wrote a breaking analysis. I asked George Gilbert, who's our, one of our lead analysts in this space. He said, I've watched Nadella's keynote so far. The enterprise software part is all about co-pilot as UI and agents as a way to learn application logic, but they <clears throat> all, all but highlighted that they don't have a source of truth other than for office docs. So this is a data problem. I think we can do blah, 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 blah. Salesforce, Salonis, and others, et cetera. So I said, it sounds like a 1.1 .1 of last year with a bit more agentic vision, but without the harmonic layer. He said, it's a bit more than 1.1. They're talking about multi-agent systems and they're elaborating on a more sophisticated stack, but both Microsoft and Salonis are pushing their customers together to use Salonis as the harmonization layer. Salonis, you know, we talked about them a lot. They just don't want to make a big deal about it and announce it if Salonis gets entrenched as the harmonization layer, essentially an abstraction layer above the data lake, the data bricks or data fabric, Salonis could disembowel their agent platform the way Databricks did to Microsoft's data and AI strategy. This is George, man, he's got the inside scoop here. But there is a profound shift that is just starting to take place yeah. from strings to things to activities and processes. Yeah. So yeah. that's pretty interesting. Basically he's saying, basically here's what he's saying. Let me translate that. You're not going to have true agentic systems without good data and, a, and you're not going to have good data without a data harmonization layer. Yeah. And nobody has that. Very few, anyway. Salonis has done some of the hard work there. People yeah. are starting to tap them, and they're trying to. They're the. We sometimes say camel's nose under the tent. Yeah. That could be a really well, you know Trojan horse well, so into that data layer. Well, I think that's absolutely right. And I think one of the things that George points out is the fact that the, the it's wild west right now, post data lake uh, era. So we we've had the data lake era. We all see what happened. Snowflake, Databricks got positions. Others are in there, but at post data lake, it's like. I call it streams. You have the streams coming off the lake and you're going to have all kinds of lake management challenges because you got to get that data into the process. What Salonis is doing that's smart is they're process engineers. Yes. Okay, and so they're looking at the end-to-end -end workloads and then taking from that piece into the infrastructure and then not trying to be the infrastructure that helped the application. So it's like the old model was you're enabled by the stack. They're saying, no, no, I want to make use data as code. And so the business model, business logic, is critical. Werner Vogel's talked about this with Lambda and serverless. The business logic is going to be the killer IP, and that's why productivity is such a big discussion, because whoever figures this out is going to do it. Now, if productivity is the outcome you want, the process is going to drive the productivity. The data has to be in a format and, and architecture for the process. So they're attacking it from the right angle. Now, right on. if you say, hey, I'm the data lake, this is all you could do, you're dead in the water. Pun intended, So you're in the lake. You just use the phrase data as code. I first heard that 10 years ago from you. Yeah. you coined, I think you coined the term business as code I last think week. I did too, yeah. Is that your term? I think I coined clustered systems too. Was that, and was that connected your term? Ecosystem. No, the clustered systems were around forever, but now they're back. And I you, mean, I you, but you picked up on it that that's the big trend. 
business is code, and that's yeah. all around that process wrap that you just gave. Yeah. That is, yeah. that yeah. is the a, another wave of again, George calls it turning strings into things and capturing yeah. processes. It, it's just what when DevOps became a, uh, an early days of the cloud, the Cloudorati group that was the first formation of the founding cloud fathers, I call them. Infrastructure as code was an infrastructure automation thing. How do I provision software in the cloud faster? And what that meant was the developers are running operations, not a different team. The developers would just stand up with command line infrastructure. Infrastructure as code became synonymous with DevOps, but also programmability of infrastructure, meaning I don't need to know how to provision stuff, just get it done. That was a revolution. The same thing's happening now with agentic systems where the applications will treat the data layer and underlying infrastructure as programmable code. I mean, just give it to me. So that means the format has to change. That's why this harmonization layer is going to sit. Now, to validate this, Amazon has repositioned SageMaker as infrastructure. If you look at their stack, the three, la three layers of their GNI stack, you'll hear all about it at, at, uh, in uh, reInvent from Matt Garman and David Brown and everybody else, is that Bedrock's the model layer. They've kind of repositioned and said Bedrock's the easy to use because SageMaker was too hard to use because it wasn't meant for the audience that was using it. It's really kind of like a command line prompt for infrastructure. It's, it's, you got to it's like you need parameters. No one could use SageMaker because the average business user, it wasn't built for too a business. Complicated. It was, it was no, too complicated. But it's powerful. Heavy lift. So they moved it down on, in the infrastructure side of the stack, which is the right place because it's an orchestration layer of the infrastructure. That easy so, button that we've been talking about all No, be Bedrock's easy button. SageMaker's the, the shim layer above um, serverless. Right. So it's, and so they kind of got smart and said, let's not, <laughs> let's not make it about the user experience, let's make it about the, the infrastructure feeding Bedrock the user experience for models. So you're starting to see the stack form simplification, uh, elements, ease of use, and again, that's the developers want. They want easy code. So, you know, Q, Q for developer, Q for business. This is kind of where it's going. So again, that's Well, it. I thought, I liked the discussion that we had last week, not to rehash it, but, but your take on my question about does Amazon have to go up the stack and into the application business, your point was if they're going to do that, they should do it by taking the things that have been successful internally within Amazon that are novel. Don't try to go be another Salesforce automation player. Totally agree with that, but identify ideally agentic processes that they're perfecting internally and then just like they did with AWS, point it to their broader customer base and that could be, uh, give them a real strategic advantage and well, even further improve their... No, Dave, we're, we're getting kicked out here on the floor. It's actually oh, wow. quiet, look at this. Like, it yeah. went by fast, John. <laughs> Why don't we just stay up all night and pull a marathon, you know? Like uh, Jerry Lewis, <laughs> the Cube Telethon, the Cube Marathon. <laughs> now you're dating yourself. <laughs> all right, well Dave, great to see you. Good salute to you in public. Thank I know we're going to be traveling. We're going to finish the show here. Uh, I'm going to try to get to Vegas, F1. Well, have fun in Vegas. If I get there. Um, if not, we'll see you at reInvent in Vegas. Yep, And then right. we'll see you in New York City a right. uh, week of December 9th. All right, you're watching theCUBE pod. Check it out, siliconangle.com, thecube.net. Um, of course, always check out our event covers and look for the, the, these new events we're doing in the studios. Um, we're going to be doing a lot more editorial events. We're going to do a lot more uh, events around things like AI for CFOs. You're going to see a lot more editorial video cube, for lack of a better word. And again, just keep on pumping out the content. Thanks for, we are in our cube factory. Soon we can call it the AI factory. <laughs> when we're an avatar, Dave. AI when, content yeah, factory. When you're a hologram. <laughs> I can't make the show, but I can put a chair there and this day the hologram. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, uh, yeah. uh, I, hope that's, I hope those days are far away. All right, we'll see you next time. <laughs>